So what happens? A couple a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks back, I said, we dedicated the building. And I called you as a church. I said, listen, I, I challenge you to rededicate yourself, dedicate your life. Rededicate yourself to the service, to serving the king, to living for the king of kings. Do you remember that? Okay. Well, I'm going to draw my your attention. Do you have the covenant, Robert? I'm going to draw your attention. Pull up the core values, if you will, uh, Robert. Core values. There are two pages there. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're in Matthew chapter 21 is where we're going to begin. I'm going to jump around a little bit, so put on your seatbelt. Chapter 21, verse 13 is where we're going to start. The covenant that we have listed, I have it up here for you to see. And those are the core values. Pull up the uh, the actual thing I sent you on the, in the email. For me. This is the actual core values that I hand you um, before you actually sign a covenant to become a member the first value is to be a house of prayer. Our desire is to be a house of prayer. Does somebody have the, the, the reference Matthew 21 verse 13? Anyone? Read it for me then. So the scripture verse that supports this core value, this is who we said as a church that we wanted to be. This is who we believe God has called us to be. And about uh, uh, some, some months back, I had asked you all, to send me emails telling me what you think are, are what are the core value to you. What was most important to you? Because what I've realized over the course of time is that these core values is actually are more aspirational values. These are the, these are values. These are, this is who we desire to be. But we're not here yet. So I, I sent, asked you to send me an email. You tell me what is core to you, what's important to you. And guess what? I got most of these back. I think our prayer ministry on Tuesday night is important, Pastor. I got a, I got a handful of those back. But if that doesn't show up on Tuesday night, I've had people tell me Sunday school is important, Pastor. But that hasn't been well attended, and so on and so forth. But being a house of prayer is something that we said we're going to be because this is what you read it again, Dennis? This is Jesus speaking. Jesus goes in, he clears out the temple because everything but prayer was taking place in the house of God. Letter B underneath our core value here says we will strive to be a house of prayer. So our prayer ministries aren't going anywhere anytime soon. In fact, they need to develop better. We're teaching on fasting on Tuesday nights. If you're missing out, you're missing out. I'm actually going to call the church to a day a day of fasting in October. It's probably the first Monday in October. And I'm going to teach a Sunday school class the Sunday that precedes the fast so that you understand what we're doing and why. Developing prayer ministries. Everything we do will be built on the foundation of prayer here. We can't do this by ourselves, church family. This is how I fight my battles. Right? I didn't see any of your it may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. You know where that passage comes from? Anybody know? Anyone? The Old Testament. Pull it up for you. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, O Lord, open his eyes, the eyes of his servant. So the Lord opened the eyes of his servant, and he looked and saw on the hills, a pool of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Second Kings chapter 6. Just when we, I'm telling this is how we fight our battles, church family. The battle's not ours, it's his. Okay, so we need to tap into this power. And we are not, we are not utilizing what God has given us. We're not. But let me get to the next core value. This is who we said we're going to be. We're going to be a house of prayer. What's the second one, church? Building relationships. Now, I told you the vision, the mission, the mission statement of the church. This is what we're supposed to do. Let me back up to the video. The video showed a, 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 a battle going on between good and evil, right? Ephesians 6 says we're in that battle, right? And Ephesians 6 says, stand fast, does it not? And it says with your shield of faith. Okay, so we have a responsibility to promote the, the gospel, right? And then when we're promoting the gospel, we're going to get flack. We're going to get pushed back from the enemy. Amen? Now, how do we as New Creation Ministry, we're just one spoke in this big old rim. How do we as New Creation Ministry engage in that battle of promoting the gospel? Well, we do it because we as a church have a mission of being a church that is intentional about making disciples who make disciples. Amen? 
And our disciples are supposed to infect those other people in our sphere of influences. For example, Brother Mark, you're a truck driver, right? Brother Sadi, he works for the railroad. Amen? Amen? You can see the retire on me. Brother Rob works at the mill, right? Sister Emmy works at a school. Brother Vern works for the county police. I work for the Hammond Police Department. Brother Frank works in the mill. Brother Anthony works in the mill. And everywhere you go, everywhere you work, wherever it is you work, you should be infecting people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the goal. And some of you come and say, Pastor, I don't know how to do that. That is our job as a church to teach you, to equip you, to give you that shield of faith so that when you go into work, when you go into the supermarket, when you go to pump your gas and you encounter people on the streets, you know how. Okay, so we do that in this church, and many of you who come here have signed a covenant saying you believe that God wants you to be a part of this here church. And in the process of signing this covenant, you agree to the battle plan, if you will. I'm handing you a scheme. I'm handing you a plan. I'm handing you a template of what we do here, and you signed on and said, yes, this is what I want to do. I believe in this. So being a house of prayer is one of them. You're not going to win this battle on your own. Number two, the second one is building relationships. When you look at discipleship in the New Testament, time and again, it was built in context of relationships. Jesus took his 12 disciples and he lived with them for three and a half years, day in and day out, not just on Sundays and Tuesdays. Day in and day out, they spent time together. They invested with each other, time with one another. They spent time together. They built each other up. They laughed together. They cried together. They ate together. They did ministry together. This is part of building relationships. In relationships, the, the, in the context of relationships, the gospel is propagated. Disciples are made. Amen? I've called softball for years. You know how I did it? On the field, not through Skype. Amen? You have to be on the field. I taught Christy how to pitch. Christy learned how to pitch pretty good. She was a pretty good pitcher. She never took any, any pitching lessons until later in life. When she was really young, I taught her how to pitch, and she was very devastated. And what it was is she was little, and all I did was, and I knew nothing about softball, nothing. Here's what I did. I learned to coach. I learned to coach. Somebody had to teach me. People smarter than who schooled me on the, on the field, that's how I learned. But with Christy, I would sit in our driveway. It's probably about 50 feet. And I would sit on a bucket, a five-gallon bucket with a mitt. And I tell her, I knew how she had the basic pitch to stand on the mound. I teach her how to step off and throw the pitch. It's a windmill pitch because the slingshot was not enough power. And she was little. So she'd throw a pitch and the ball would fly away over here. And I'm like, what the heck was that? She's like, I don't know. But I watched her pitch. I watched her release. I watched her footwork. And I watched what she did. I said, okay. And I just keep watching it. Finally, when she threw a good one, I saw what she did right. I saw her footwork. I saw her release. I saw what she did. And I told her, do that again. And when she did it the second, when she threw one good pitch, the second bad pitch, I was able to tell her what was different from the first. I was looking for consistency. I told her, look, do this. This is what you did this time. You threw a good pitch. This is what you did that time. You threw a bad one. And she learned. She learned to develop consistency over the course of time because I coached her. I was there. Every day, I'd come home from school. Come on, Dad, let's throw the pitches. I'm like, man, I'm tired. But she wanted to work at it every day. Am I kidding? Was it every day? It was every day. Every day. After practice, we come home for practice. Come on, Dad. I'm like, can we just practice? She said, come on, just 100 pitches. And I'd count them, two, one, two, because after 100, she said, one, one, that's it, it's 100. Get them tired. It's been a long day. I got a job. I got a wife. I got a, come on, I can't play softball. Come on, Dad. Boom. You know what I'm getting at? She had a passion for softball. Never got enough. She wanted more. She hunger, thirst for more. Most Christians don't live our life like that. Sunday is good enough. See you next Sunday. Building relationships in the context of relationships is where discipleship will take place. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. Anybody, pull that one up for me, please. When you have it, let me know so you can read it. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 through 40. Anyone? This is our second core values. This is who we as a ministry believe that God has called us to be. Got it? Anybody? Yes. 
All of the laws and all of the prophets hinge on these two commandments. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, mind, and all your soul. With all that you are, we should love God like that. This is this relationship here. This relationship here ultimately can be measured by this one here. The way I treat my brother says how much I love God. Because this brother or this sister was created in the image of God. The Bible says how in the world can you possibly love a God who you've never seen when you can't even love the sister he put right in front of your face? Oh, I love her. She just gets on my nerves. That's not love. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. We have a responsibility to build relationships. Jesus said that love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, with all your mind, with all that you are, and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, she gets on my nerves. Get over it. He chews too loud. Don't sit next to him. Get over it. We find excuses to dislike people. We find that our personalities are different. No kidding. You imagine how boring this world would be if we were all the same. God never intended us to be the same. He intended for us to be different, according to Tim's synopsis of the battle between uh, 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 the Avengers and Deep. All these different people coming together with different talents, different gifts, different skill sets to fight the same battle. Amen? Making disciples. New Creation's mission statement. Be a church that creates disciples who are intentional about making disciples who will make disciples to infect people in our sphere of influence. Police department, mill, railroad, truck driver, teacher, and so on, and so on. Where do you get equipped for that? You get it here, but you're not going to get it through osmosis. Making disciples, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18, and somebody else go to chapter 28, verse 19. Matthew 4, 18, and Matthew 28, 19. These are the scripture verses that back up core value number three, making disciples. Core value number two in building relationships is we'll be intentional on building relationships by strengthening the current relationships we have and with one another and initiating new ones. Listen, church family, if you are a member of this church, my expectation of you as a member, I drove by a church the other day that says visitors are welcome on your marquee. It says members are expected. There's expectations on membership. Which is why you sign a covenant. And to be quite honest with you, I as your pastor have taken a subtle approach to kind of steer people back to the covenant they signed. Well, I'm, not, I'm, gonna, I'm promising you from this day forward, I'm going to take a not so subtle approach. Because subtleties don't seem to work. Okay, I'm going to do it in love, but I'm going to remind you of a commitment that you've made. Dedicate yourself to the Lord afresh and anew. Chapter 4, verse 18, anybody? Making disciples. I want to read it. Jesus walks down the street, well, not the street, he walks down the beach, and he sees two brothers casting a net, they're fishing, they're working, they're doing their thing, and he says, hey, he calls out to one of them, he says, follow me. He calls out to the other, the one brother calls to the other, and actually says, hey, we found him, come on, let's go. And they leave their nets, and they stop what they're doing, and immediately follow Jesus. Jesus was taking the time to teach somebody else what he already knew, to help them mature, so that they could carry on the work of his ministry long after he was gone. Chapter 28, verse 19. Anyone else? Go ahead, Anthony. Where, what, what is that called? Anybody know? It's the Great Commission. The Bible, the Great Commission, Jesus has commissioned us. He's commanded us to go and make disciples of all nations. It's not the great request. It's not the great suggestion. It is the Great Commission. Now let me ask you this, church family. People tell me this all the time. Hey, we're not growing. What have you done to help us grow? When's the last time you invited somebody to our church? When is the last time you offered to help serve in an area that needs help? What new ministries can you bring to the table? And I'm not saying we should have 12,000 ministries to do here because more doesn't always mean better. We need to focus on what we do. We need to do what we do well. The Awana program is part of discipleship, making disciples out of these little kids. The nursery, moving the kids to the back, not so that you know, so that they're out of our hair, but they're actually they're they're back there. They're being loved on. They're being uh, ministered to by somebody in the nursery. We're going to start a nursery. If you're interested in helping in that, 
We have a sign-up sheet for you. That's an area you can serve. That helps people in here who have ADD, spiritual ADD, and can't focus when they hear a baby cry or somebody talk or, God forbid, a door slam. You say, what can I do, Pastor? I don't know what to do. Well, we can help you with that. Making disciples. Vern read a passage. Anthony read a passage. We will be intentional about modeling Christian virtues. Modeling Christian virtues. I have Christian friends at work that I constantly have conversations with them, reminding them to walk in life. They remind me, Pastor, you're a testimony. Make sure you watch where you where you where, where you laughing at or where, wherever you, whatever it is that we're doing. Because we talked about this during our prayer service, it's easy to get sucked in to all the flim flam at work. It's easy. We have a testimony. Modeling Christian virtue. You are your brother's keeper. Admonishing our other believers to become imitators of Jesus Christ. The vehicle that's primarily going to drive this is Sunday school, which is poorly attended, so we went away from it. Small groups, home groups, something we're going to revisit. Breaking bread fellowships, coming together, helping Christians learn to be Christians. I told you his brother Frank was my disciple when I was a baby Christian. I learned all this stuff. This is great, but how do you apply it practically? The rubber meets the road. How does a Christian police officer, how, what does that look like? What does the Christian husband look like? I know what the Bible said. What does it look like? How do you flush out the practical aspects of it? How does that, what does a Christian father look like? My kid needs a spanking. Should I spank them? What does the Bible teach? How do you work that out? You need someone to help model it for you. Brother Frank modeled that for me. He was not perfect, and that was something else he modeled for me. Well, failure. Whenever he screwed up, how he picked himself up, dust himself off, repented. He modeled consistency for me. And I thank God for that. We need that in our life, church. But we don't want to be rebuked. We won't want to be corrected because it doesn't feel good. It stings. Fourth and final core value. I've seen churches, they got like 20 of them. 20 core values, we got a whopping four. House of prayer, build relationships. Let's make disciples in the context of those relationships. And let's cultivate need. Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. Vern, you just read it. Will you read it again? Somebody else turned to Proverbs 27, 17. And I need a third person to find Titus chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. Jesus called these two to build relationships with them. In the process of that relationship, he invested himself in them and, and, and made disciples, followers. There come a time when Jesus leaves and those two followers become leaders. And they begin to lead. This is the natural order of things. This is the natural process. This is biblical. So a pastor is not just coming up with this stuff off the top of my head. This is what we decided we, this is what we believe God has called us to be as new creation ministry to help fight that spiritual battle in Ephesians 6 that we're talking about that was illustrated for you with the Avengers video. Proverbs 27, 17. Anyone? What translation do you have? NLT. Good. It's gender neutral usually because uh, that pro that verse is constantly used with men. It's iron sharpens iron, so is one man to another. Men need men to hold each other accountable. Do we got not do that? Yeah, I say that. Come on, man. Come on, man. But usually that's all it takes for a dude, right? Usually, if I'm walking and something happens, and Frank looks at me, come on, man. Y'all know what that means. Straighten yourself up, dude. Come on, dude. Come on. That's usually all it takes. You don't have to beat him down. But you said iron sharpens iron, so is one friend to another because it does apply to women, too. Ladies, if you have a mentor in your life, you have a, a spiritual, a sister who comes alongside you and walks with you, tells you, hey, and when you come to work, if you come to church, you're like, man, my husband got on my nerves this morning, so I just want to just, you know, ah! And that sister says, come on, let's pray. Well, I've been there. But that doesn't honor God. That helps. So let's do something about that. And you're not condemning them. You're bringing them back. And then the last one. The verse that I say? Titus, who's got it? Anybody? Anyone? Two, one. Two, one through five. Go ahead. Okay, 
purpose in the in the under the core value of cultivating leaders. The main point here is this: what Brother Dennis just read in Titus is that women need to mentor women. We have a call to joy program that Brother Frank is actually overseeing. If you desire to be mentored in your faith, you need to talk with Pastor Frank. We brought this up in the past, and to be honest with you, we have not done a good job of rebroadcasting that, if you will. You need to know that we have a discipleship program in place here in our church to help women grow in their faith from other women. And the same is true for men. We have men that can help you grow in your faith as a man. And I'm not talking about coming to church. I'm not talking about uh, the going to church and doing church. I'm talking about being the church. Because that is the vision of the church. The mission statement is to create disciples who make disciples who make disciples so we can infect people in our little bubbles in our life. The vision of the church, what we desire to be. I want people to look at this church. This is what a vision, this is the difference between vision and mission. Mission is what are we doing? What's the goal? Vision is when other people look at us, what do they see? I want people to look at this church and say, that is a church that acts like a church. This ain't the church, folks. We are. One of the things we do here, which, which is very biblical and it's just awesome, is the mobile market. If you've never been a part of that, to be able to just bless people who don't have, it's a blessing. I promise you, if you haven't been here, I would encourage you to come out. If you want information on that, talk to Brother John. This is an opportunity for us to serve. Let it be here in our core, in our, our core values. It should be up on the overhead there. Uh, we'll be intentional about cultivating leaders by helping people assimilate into the church. When you come into this church, that welcome table back there, that, that visitor's card is for us to help you find a place here. Most of you here know each other. That's intentional. That's by design. When a person walks through that door, my expectation of you as, as your pastor, to you as a member, is to greet guests. I don't care what he looks like. I don't care what she smells like. I don't care. My expectation as your pastor is that you greet our guest. This is our father's house. We should be hospitable. Cultivating leaders. Helping people assimilate into the local church. Help them discover their spiritual gift. Encourage them to serve according to their giftedness. Men will mentor men. Women will mentor women. This is what our core, this is what we believe God has called us to be. This will grow you in your, your faith, help you to become more mature, help you to disciple somebody else, help that disciple to become another disciple, to know disciples, to disciple, and to be exponential and to reach the ends of the earth, which is what Jesus Christ called us to do. Amen? This is the game plan. You say, okay, great, Pastor. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I command, he, all the way to the ends of the earth. Great, Pastor. That's a great command, but how in the world do we do that? Here's your old man. I'm telling you, it's that simple. It ain't easy. Because this takes commitment. This takes discipline. But it's simple. I, I, I have a roadmap right here. Now, as far as your covenant goes, this is what you signed. Those of you who are members, this is what you signed to be. And you may say, Pastor, what's this going? We're talking about a spiritual battle. We're engaged in a spiritual battle. You are going to be a casualty of the spiritual battle if you do not purge yourself with the armor of God. If you don't know how to do that, we're here to help you do that. I want to teach you so that you can teach someone else. Here's your covenant. This is what you signed. I will protect the unity of my church. It's our church. We're the church. We're a family. We need to protect the unity. When I hear Brother Frank talking smack about Brother Jason, this doesn't happen. That's why I use those two as an example. When Brother Frank is talking smack to Brother Dennis about Brother Jason, and I overhear that, protecting the unity means saying, come on, man. Come on, dude. You got a problem with Jason. You need to talk. You know that. You know, come on. You know better. I'm not condemning you. We've all been these trust. But steering them back, bro, come on. Come on. And you know what Matthew 18 says. <laughs> he ain't got nothing to do with it. He shouldn't be listening. You shouldn't be listening. Brother Dennis, you should have told him. Dennis, you're right. That's protecting the unity of the church, acting in love towards one another. Jason Perfect, I can assure you he's not. None of us are. If we want to examine each other's flaws, we can do that all day long. Refusing to gossip. That was the example I just showed you. I just said Dennis probably shouldn't have entertained that. That's easy to do, though. Trust me. 
when Frank goes, woo! <laughs> you see what happened? Dennis says, no, what happened? He don't know God yet. Man, brother Jason, and he starts talking, and now Dennis is right there. He's like, oh, really? And he's hooked now. He's dragged in. Can't help it. Sometimes you can't help it. I get it. That's where the other person comes around. Me, not privy to that, catch this. I will see it. You need to correct it. You have a responsibility, church family. You have a responsibility to your family. Would you allow that garbage in your own biological home? I assure you, if you have children, any of you who have children, would not allow that between your children or someone else coming outside your home trying to disrupt the unity of your house. I guarantee it. If you don't have kids, put your spouse in that place. Let somebody come in and start. I mean, even if it's not even uh, legitimate, it's just perceived. You're going to rise up to defend your spouse. We're not going to tolerate somebody tearing down our spouse or our children. But we allow it in our churches all day long. We say we're a church family, are we? Following the leaders. I'm going to tell you this, and not just because I'm your pastor. But if I was not your pastor, I would be the best member that I could be. How do I know that? Because I wasn't always a pastor. I will submit myself to my pastor's leadership as long as he is not doing anything ungodly, immoral, or illegal. If you signed this covenant, there was a time in your walk when you came here that you said you believe this is where God wants you to be. God will call you to a church, and he will call you someplace else. When it's time for you to go. And until then, you should sit still and submit yourself to the leadership that's in place, whether it's me or someone else. If you want to be a thorn in my side, you're better off going somewhere else. I say that as your pastor, and I would say that as a deacon or just a regular old member. That's the truth. Sharing in the responsibility of the church, pray for its growth. There's plenty to do here. I'm going to hand out these cards. I'm not going to get to it today because I'm going to run out of time. But I'm going to preach a different message next week regarding evangelism. And this is an awesome tool that I'm going to share with you next Sunday. But we need to be in a place. If we evangelize, let's say we went out into the highways and byways today and all week long and invited people to church. And next Sunday we come back and those doors open up and we triple the number of people who come in. Triple. First of all, we're not going to have enough seats. Would you as a member be willing to give up your coveted seat to a visitor? Would you as a member be willing to stand up and, or move your car across the street or down the street, park somewhere else so that they could park? Would you be willing to help usher? Or we need a nursery because half those people who piled in here have kids. Willing to give up sitting in here to go back there to serve, to, be, to minister to somebody who comes through. That's what point number two is in your covenant. Willingness to share in the responsibility of the church. Pray for its growth. Invite the unchurched to attend. When's the last time you've done that? And most importantly, warmly welcoming those who visit. It makes all the difference. Raise your hand if you've ever visited a church where you walked through the door and felt like the bald headed stepchild. Sorry, Mark. <laughs> I've been in that church. God, that's a. One more time. Raise those hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25 people in a room this small? That's embarrassing. That's a tragedy. Let's not be that church. What's got two thumbs and don't want to be that church? This guy right here. Amen? Point three in your covenant. I will serve the ministry of my church. Serve in the ministry of your church. You've got plenty to do. Discover your gifts and talents. Be equipped. If you don't know how, you need to be equipped. I, as your pastor, can help you with that. Call to joy ministry, Sunday schools, and Tuesday night prayer services are just the two. And developing a servant's heart. Really, bottom line, it comes to Jesus Christ said, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. Amen? We need to develop a servant's heart. We need to learn how to serve people. And most people don't want to do that, especially in a culture here in America that says me, me, me. I was covering the widow's fast on Tuesday night. Never even heard of it. Widow's fast says that a person fasts and goes without food. Let's say, for example, uh, you normally would go out for lunch every day at work, and your lunch costs you eight bucks. Okay, so you say, I'm going to fast all week long, just my lunch. So those $8 that I normally would spend on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, five times eight is 
All right, mathematician. So we got forty dollars at the end of the week. You fasted all those days, and you picked that out and you donated to a cause for somebody hungry, and somehow, some way, help you know feed some people. That's what the widows fasted. It was really cool, and nothing moved the heart more. Nothing moved the heart of God more than when we sacrificed brothers. So serving people, it's actually a, a sacrifice. It moves the heart of God, but more importantly, it's what Jesus called us to do. I support the testimony of my church. Here's the last one. I serve in the ministry, discovering my gifts and talents, being equipped by my pastor, developing a servant's heart. And you know what? A lot of people, they just can't serve. They just don't have it in them. Some people were born to serve. On a scale of 1 to 10, they're a 12. Some people just ain't going to serve. On a scale of 1 to 10, they're a negative 1. But that negative 1 can learn to be a 2 or a 3. It'll never be a 12, probably. We can all grow, and the 12 is going to be a 15. Because what he does naturally is going to enhance when he, when he realizes his purpose. The testimony of our church is an important one. Attend faithfully. Come to church. And I met a guy this weekend. This week, Brother Dennis was with me. I was at work. I should say not because I'm on a live stream. But uh, Brother Dennis was with me, and I met a guy on a call I was on. And uh, I invited the man to church. He's in the midst of a storm, like Christy was talking about. And I reached out to this man, and he said to me, he says, you know, I'm a policeman in a uniform. It had a probable cause to snatch him up and take him to jail. But in my heart, realized that that probably wasn't going to rectify his problem. It was just going to prolong the inevitable. So I'm seeking alternatives. At the end of it, when it was all said and done, he was very grateful. He shakes my hand, and he tells me, he says, you know, you have a really sweet spirit about you. Something about you. I said, as I said something about blessing, and I said, I'm a man of God, that I love God, I serve God, I'm a pastor. You're a pastor? I said, yeah. He said, what do you, what do you pastor a church? He reached me for his phone. I said, in Highlands. He said, man, even the address rate punched it in his phone. I said, I'll do you one better. I gave him a business card. So the service starts at 10 o'clock. He said, I'll see you Sunday. I said, I'll be looking for you. Well, it's not here. It's not here. But I ministered to him world in which we live in right here right now is a mission field and we're missing because we're too wrapped up in ourselves but what he said to me was there's a sweet spirit about you something about you what is it brother he saw Jesus Christ in you that's what he saw I was trying to shine that light I was trying praise the Lord God gave me the grace to do it you can do the same I promise you you're missing opportunities if you haven't done it Pay attention for him. So here's what he said to me. He said, well, our, because I told him, I said, maybe you guys need some counseling. Maybe you need to go see your pastor. And he said, I said, you go to church? That's another thing. I said. And he says, you know, we haven't been to church in a long time. I said, it's part of your problem. And he says, here's what I'm getting, church family. We tell people we're Christians. We go to church. We love God. We serve God. Yet we don't go to church. We don't We do not do any. We're, we're, we're a bad testimony. Attend faithfully. Live a godly life. Let your light so shine before men that they'll see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? And giving regularly. I've had mature believers who believe in a biblical tithe, 10% of your gross earnings monthly. I had a person who tell me, how come that doesn't say tithe? So I'll tell you why, brother. Because like in any other area of our walk, we need to grow. Many people struggle with tithing. I was one of those Christians. I just couldn't give. I couldn't live off 100% of my earnings. You think I could do it off of 90? I just couldn't do it. But I wanted to. And God has grown me in the grace of giving. Praise the Lord. I can help you with that too. I got I got a trick. It worked for me. It'll work for you. I promise you. I promise you it'll work. I'll tell you what my trick is. I couldn't do, I couldn't do it. Couldn't. I just didn't have it, man. I'm a mathematical guy. I made a, a withdrawal from my account. It went straight to the check to the church. The initial, just like your taxes, you get your net, you got what you got, you figure it out. You make whatever works. That's how I did it. And when I left my last church and started here, I never switched that over. I just continued on in the discipline of giving. But it's something I have to learn, something I have to grow in. And giving regularly is not just your money, but somebody has to pay for your life. Somebody has to pay for the air conditioning, somebody that you can so enjoy. But it's, before, it's beyond that. Giving is, is what God has required of us. He's what he's asked us to do. 
God says that he will provide for you. He will take care of you. He wants to prove himself to you. But it's not just the money. It's your time. You know what? I'm not trying to blow my own horn. But when we leave here today, some of you will probably leave here and not think about church again until next Sunday. Maybe you come on Tuesday night and then you check out till next Sunday. I have a number in my head. And I'm going to write it down. It's a percentage. Hold on. How much, babe? I, don't, I want you to take a guess. How much of our conversations, mine and yours, would you say is dedicated to ministry throughout the week? She said at least 80%. What did I write, Dennis? 90% of our conversations, mine and my wife, are ministry related. You wonder why we needed a sabbatical? <laughs> we needed some time for us. And it's not a bad thing. I'm not complaining. I'm just saying is most people will check out from here. And I guarantee you, your conversations aren't 90% church. <laughs> I can't guarantee you that. But I'm pretty sure they're not. Attending faithfully, live a godly life, and giving regularly. Your time our most precious commodity. I ain't getting those back. Your talent. Brother Robert got skills back there in that sound room. Jim, man, I asked, Christina asked him for a book. Man, he's got every sermon since he's been here. Every one of them documented on a, on a hard drive somewhere. Archives and videos. The beast. That's his talent. That's his gift. And he's serving God. Whether it's singing, whether it's serving, whatever it is. Get in where you fit in is what I like to say. Why? Because that makes this church strong. And this church is part of the church. Universal Church, I told you the big old tire, how many spokes are in that rim? We're just one spoke. And you say, Pastor, I don't know how to do these things. I'm giving you the game plan. I'm spelling it out for you. I've done this before. I'll do it again. I told you guys this is young. Oh, let me see this. You know, I went, I don't know if you know this or not. Some of you probably do. But I went to a uh, a church planting school. Because this is a church plant. This doesn't even start. We started with nothing. We had articles with the corporation. We didn't know what we were doing. And we asked people for help and they were, well, it depends. Church planting is contextualized. That's we want no kidding. This is our context. Help me out. Tell us what you need. I don't know what I need. We spent years doing it. Am I right, John? Brother John, am I right? Brother Jason? We're like scratching our head trying to figure it out. But when I went to church planting school, <laughs> it was more of an assessment, really. They told me, hey, you're going to do great. And you got all this passion and all this and whatever. And they said, just be careful you don't outrun your health. I didn't know what that meant. I know not. Um, but we were sitting there, and me, Hank, you guys remember Hank last week when you came? That last week? Two weeks ago? Me, Hank, and Brother Frank, Frank the Tank Mueller. We were at the associational office, and they were sitting down, and they were telling us, you know, they, man, they gave us a lot of stuff. And I'm like, it's like trying to drink water from a hydrant. I was just like, man, it was so much, just so much. And I didn't know how this was going to fly. But anyway, they said, okay, if you can draw all your ministry and what it's going to look like, draw it out on paper, what would that look like? <laughs> Sitting in the middle, Hank's on one side, Frank's on the other. They both look at me like, what the heck does that mean? Draw your ministry. And I said, I think I got it. It's going to be good because we don't know what the heck he's talking about. So, I think I shared this with you guys before. As a matter of fact, I know I did. What I did was I drew a picture. At that time, I was Gavit, uh, Gavit, and Hammond, uh, Gavit, and High, Gavit and Hammond. Gavit High School in Hammond was a school that I was the school resource officer for. My responsibility was to provide protection, coverage, officers covering, and even uh, the plan and everything for the, the safety plan for that school. That was my headache, my area of responsibility. Gavin had 1,600 kids in that school. At that time, about 800 middle school, 800 high school students. This way's north. All right, so what I did was uh, I was able to see what happened in the mornings before the kids come in. There was a, this is the south side of the parking lot. There's these doors over here, these double doors where the kids come in. This is the parking lot here where all the cars park. Most of the parents dropped their kids off here. They came in here. Some went into a cafeteria that was here. Okay, and when they went into that cafeteria, they were eating breakfast, some waited. Most of the kids waited out here. 
What happened is, once those doors opened, these kids came up this hallway. There was another set of doors here where other kids came through. But all the kids funneled down this hallway. It was this way, the one-way street. Follow me? So what happens is, once they're in here, there's classrooms along the way. Middle school classrooms. The avenue essentially is divided in half. This side was the high school. I'm doing this upside down, so forgive me. And this side was the middle school. Okay? So when all the kids come in, they go into their classrooms, middle school students, go into their classrooms. There was a stairwell here. It took those kids up to the second floor, to the third floor, okay? Once you cross the middle of the hallway, this side of the school was essentially a mirror's image of the other side, uh, with the exception of the cafeteria. There was a gym over here, gym over here, and again, the three floors. I don't know if you can follow me or not. Follow me? Am I lost? Okay. So the doors open, kids come in. Doors open, kids come in. It's 8 o'clock-ish. And Hammond, 8.15, 8.20, 8.35, 8.40, kind of like here. You show up when you show up, but we're glad you're here. What happened is, amen. So what happens is, once the kids come in here, uh, just follow me, if you will. Uh, as I, My goal as a, as a police officer at school was to build relationships with these kids. You know why? Because these kids, a lot of these kids don't like the police. You know why? Because policemen are jerks sometimes. That's why. Policemen have taken their mom or dad to jail sometimes. In some of these cases, these kids never interact with a cop, ever. And now, they don't have a positive outlook on police. So my goal was, especially in the cafeteria, was to talk to these kids. Hey, do you watch that Bears game? Man, I hate the Bears. Really, man? I love the Bears. And we start dialoguing about things that are inconsequential. We start building relationships on things of lesser importance. So when I catch the kid ready to get into a fight or throw food or whatever, and I finally come to correct his behavior, it's not the first time I ever spoke to the kid. I say, man, come on, don't do that. And a wise man once told me that rules without relationships lead to rebellion. But if I establish a relationship with this child, now when I correct them, they're more likely to submit themselves to what I'm telling them because of the context of our relationship. I weeded out officers that were jerks and brought in officers that had the same philosophy and the same paradigm that we had. This is the new direction we're going as a security team. We're more than cops. We're counselors. We're friends. And if you don't like that, go work in one of the other schools where they have a different philosophy. This is ours. Some guys left. Anyway, follow me. Here's my, here's my plan. Upperclassmen, lost cause. Here was, the, here was the mentality of a policeman that worked at Gavin before I got there in the cafeteria like this, sipping on his coffee, reading the newspaper. Is that a fight? No, it's not. Okay. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? He said, oh, we're here in case a fight breaks out. I'm like, dude, you're here for so much more than that. So, the upperclassmen, the high school, 11th, 12th graders have been there for all those years, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 7, 6 years you got them, right? All those years you have those kids, they've already developed a philosophy, they've developed a mindset, they've developed uh, the DNA of the school, and this is how it was. So when I came in, I targeted the sixth graders. I targeted the sixth graders in the cafeteria. I began to teach them what I expected from them. As the police, sit in your row, dump the trash when I say, raise your hand, don't run around. I mean, do all these things, I started to implement these things, I put up rules. I started to teach the sixth graders, seventh, seventh, and eighth. The point is, I tracked my sixth graders all the way through high school. By the time they graduated high school, I was actually starting this church here when I left that school. But the culture of the, of the school has shifted. The mentality has changed. It took six, seven years to get there, but it was a slow process. But you know, if you track the sixth graders, so the sixth graders come through this door, goes into his classroom. Next year, he'll be up on the second floor where he's in seventh grade. And the next year, he'll be on the third floor where he's the eighth grade. And then the following year, he'll cross over to the ninth grade wing of the school, and 10th, 11th, and 12th, and so on. And eventually, when he graduates, he graduates in this here gym. And he exits these doors out into the real world with a, with, a, with a high school diploma. Some go to the military, some go to college, and they apply the things that they've learned in school, both in the classroom and from my efforts, I, I would hope, to come back through these doors someday to be teachers, principals, substitutes, cafeteria workers. Are you following me? So this is the school. And you're like, what the heck does the school got to do with church, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because when I was asked to come up with a, a drawing, what would your church look like? 
This came to me so easy. Here it is. Can't say amen is what you say out, Stan. These doors for our church, this is not Gavin any longer. This is our high school. This is our, our church. These doors, how do you get people in to your church? How do you get them in? Through evangelism, invitation? Most of you, if you're here today because somebody personally invited you, raise your hand. That is the primary way people come to church. Events can, how many of you come through an event and been here ever since? Okay, got a couple. This is the most, most effective way. Here was the vision God has given me. This is the, this is the, and it hasn't changed. We've gotten on track. We've drifted a little bit. And I'll show you that responsibility, but we're getting back on track. We're bringing people through these doors into our churches through what we call a dynamic corporate worship style. There was a time here at the church. We had two pianos going, a drum, bass. Several voices, whatever the case may be, people leading us in song. The worship experience was dynamic. People say, well, you know what? I don't care for Christa, the contemporary sound. Sorry, that's the way we're going. I don't think we should have drums in the church. Sorry, that's the way we're going. I believe music ministers to the souls of people. If you don't believe me, I'm telling you, maybe you're not particularly fond of this type of music, but I am telling you, pick a song. Pick a genre that you are fond of, and I guarantee you get your toes tapped. You start wanting to dance. Yeah! I'm feeling it. Music moves people. It does. Now, granted, we walk by faith, not by sight. Our experience with God is more than, more than an emotional encounter. I get that. But God uses music time and again. If you don't believe that's true, then go to a, go to a concert, a Christian concert. See what happens to you. If you don't believe that's true, go to a ladies' event. Go to a men's event where the music gets you. They got them lights up there and all this. I'm like, woo! Iron sharpens iron. I'm like, woo! Ain't that how we leave? Yeah! Man! Woo! Ready to say, storm the gates of hell with a water gun. Yeah! Yeah! And then you come back and a week, two weeks down the road, you like, what happens? The dynamic work, worship experience brings you in and it elevates you. It does for most people. Again, if that's not your style, I mean, I can't go to a heavy metal concert and I can't rock out. That's not my thing. I probably would check out. I, I get it. What I'm saying is music, for the most part, moves people. Part of my Catholic upbringing, that's one of the things I hated, the organ. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was atrocious. And I don't need to be offensive, but for me, it wasn't my thing. First time I went into a, a, a church, they had drums and they had a. I was like, man, no, some people that's sacrilegious. You shouldn't be screaming and hollering. Oh, really? Really? I get excited about the stupid bear scoring a touchdown. Woo! <laughs> Woo! Yeah! Over a touchdown? Then the subsequent plays and interception, they lose the game. We get excited over football. You get it. I'm telling you, you get excited. Maybe it's not football for you. Food, shopping, pick your poison. We can get excited about all this garbage that doesn't matter, has no kingdom significance whatsoever. And we can't get excited about our God. That's fine. I mean, hey, maybe that's the way you're wired. Sorry, I'm wired a whole different way, as you can see. We bring them into corporate worship. Why doesn't the high from the men's conference or the ladies' conference, or why doesn't it last? This is why. There is no follow-up in these little classrooms where people learn and grow. You can't take a sixth grader and drop them in 12th grade. It's a journey. You take this baby Christian, you bring them in. Most people, if somebody doesn't know anything about church at all, would come into a dynamic worship experience and say, this is cool, this is fun. I could do, I'll come back. It was exciting. If nothing else, at least it was interesting. They're being exposed to the word of God. They come back next week for that dynamic worship experience is what we're geared for. This is what we believe that God has called us to. This is the direction. This is the path that we're on. We've deviated for other reasons, for reasons, uh, other reasons, the different, whatever the case may be, but we're getting back on track. The dynamic worship experience is what brings them in. The classrooms are what keeps them. Sunday school, small groups. This is how you learn. This is how you grow in your faith. Eventually, somewhere along the lines, you go from being a... a a disciple or a student, because the word disciple means to teach, to instruct, to discipline. 
we teach a, a person, we teach them the disciplines of the Christian walk in these here classrooms, and then eventually they move on, and then they become more mature in their faith, and maybe they're in a place where they actually start serving, maybe they come to a place where they actually start teaching, maybe they come to a place where they go out the door and they become missionaries or pastors or church planters, that is the goal. I had a pastor ask me, what are you going to do when you push everybody out those doors in the gym? I said, we cast the net and drag in more feet. You think this is it? Come on, church. You got work to do. This is the easiest way I can explain it to you. A dynamic worship style is something that we desire here at the church. It is some direction that we are going in. I preached a whole sermon on worship one Sunday when we did the music first and we did the preaching first and the music last. Worship is participatory. The praise and worship team is up here using their talents and their gifts to, 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 look, to draw you into the presence of God. And it works. Curtains are closed because somebody walks up to that side door and you see a silhouette, you're like, distraction. We got spiritual ADD. The praise team is up here trying to draw you into the presence of God with the talents and the gifts of God's giving. The hope, the goal, is the desire is that you would join them in that. Join in, participate. I've asked you already in the past that when the offering passes, once the plate passes, to join me standing. This is our time where we give God more than our than our tithe. We're giving them our praise and sacrifice of praise as well. This is, an, this is the church culture. We want to bring to the, to the Lord the sacrifice of praise. We want to give him what he rightfully deserves. And it's more than our talent and our time and our treasure. Give him the praise that he deserves. If you want to clap your hands, clap your hands. If you don't, don't. But I'm inviting you. If you are one of those charismatic, if you will, for lack of a better term, hand clapping, foot clapping, hand raising, hooping, howling, and one of those kind of Christians, come on to the front. And if you're not, maybe you should move to the back. Because you're distracted. The enemy uses distractions. It is one of his goals. You know why he wants to disrupt what's going on here? Let me show you. You got the pyramid real quick? I'll close with this. I've used this one before too. Maslow has a pyramid, a hierarchy of needs. The first one is physiological needs. The person needs food, water, and warmth, and rest in order to feel human. If a person doesn't have a place to live, if a person is hungry, nothing else matters. If you've ever been hangry, you know what I'm talking about. When you're hungry, food trumps everything. If I slap a chokehold on you, Air is going to trump everything. You're going to fight me to the death to get loose so that you can breathe. Food, water, and air. The basic human needs are at the bottom of Maslow's pyramid. When we come together as a church, most of us have these needs met. We move into the second phase. See, these are basic needs. The second one is security and safety. Most of us feel safe here. You don't feel that somebody's going to storm the doors and shoot us up, even though it could happen. Most of us don't feel that that's going to happen. What happens in a church, we reach this point. Belongingness and love, intimate relationships and friends. Some of us fit better here than others. This is where we as a church need to do a better job. Because if we can't nail this down, we won't get here. These are psychological needs. Prestige, feeling of accomplishment. What's our accomplishment? Accomplishing the goal that Jesus Christ has called us to of propagating the gospel. We'll never get here. Never get here if you can't get past here. The enemy keeps us here. Bickering and fighting among your brothers and sisters over stupid stuff that doesn't mount to a hill of beans. You can't get past that. We're not going to get past that. And if you can't get past that, you'll never hit the self-actualization. Achieving goals, full potential, including creative activity. We're stuck. We're stuck in the relationship part. You know why? Because the weapons of our warfare are not gone. We are fighting a spiritual enemy with, with carnal tools. We're fighting our brothers and sisters. Trust me, your fight is not with them. It's with the enemy. 
We'll never move up this pyramid. We'll never accomplish this. We'll never accomplish what God has called us to as a church if we can't get past this. This is where we're stuck, church. Sometimes we move past it a little bit, and then we take we take two steps forward and three, three steps back. Next week when we come back, I'm going to hand you out these cards. I'm going to preach a little bit about this here, about the gospel and example. This is an awesome tool. I'm going to share it with you next week. But this doesn't mean anything. If we bring in 300 people next Sunday, we have to move to another facility because we just got too many people and we're still stuck in this middle piece with the belonging and the need. Here's psychology 101. You ready? Some people spend four years in college trying to figure this out. I'm going to give it to you in one word, one sentence. Ready? Everyone needs to feel important. Fact. You can't just discount a person's feelings, how they feel, what they think. If you step on somebody's toes, inadvertently or intentionally, it still hurts. If I walk over here and go talk to Brother Anthony and I accidentally step on Frank's toes, and he goes, ow, I'm like, oops, my bad, didn't mean to do that. Or if he makes me mad and I stomp it anyway, and he says, ow, and I, I should apologize. Whether you intended to do something or not, it still hurts. And many of us feel entitled or whatever the case may be, you're hurting the belongings and the needs, the love, the needs, or the intimate relationships, the friendships that are developing in the church because of that, Alice, I don't care attitude. And I can promise you this. I have people at work ask me all the time. I can tell you this. I had a person ask me a relationship question at work. My girlfriend is getting on my nerves. Don't love her. I love her, but I'm not in love with her. I don't know what to do. We got a baby together. I'm like, <laughs> what do you want me to say? I said, you love her? Yeah, but I'm not in love with her. That's a cop -out. What do you mean? What drew, do you her, what drew her to you in the first place? What drew you to her in the first place? Uh, you got to have something in common. You have to go back. It's worth it. Just figure it out. I don't know, man. Maybe this is just a flaw in my personality. I said, bang. There you go. The problem ain't necessarily with the spouse. The problem is with you. You're willing to throw this person away and start over because this person doesn't do it for you anymore. When you move on to the next person, the next person, may they're going to do it for you for a little while, and then once that wears off, you're going to discard that one too and move on to the next one. See, the problem is you, you need to figure that out. You can't change that person. I tell people all the time when I marry them, do you truly believe that God has brought you together? And they say yes every time. Back to the church context. When you join this church, I ask the same question. Do you feel God calling you here? And most people who sign the covenant say yes. Well then, if things ain't working out well, or you're just annoyed, or whatever whatever the case may be, but I need to move on. God should be calling you someplace else, for sure, number one. But number two, I'd ask you, have you explored the flaws in your own personality? The things? But you know, I had a friend of mine, in fact, he's right here, a good friend of mine, he passed away. Great man of God. I keep his picture on my pulpit every Sunday a great man. He had struggles with his wife. And his wife had struggles of assimilating into the church, finding that belonging and that love and that need part. I wasn't a pastor. We were both lay leaders, lay workers at the church. And he said, we're going to leave the church. We're going to go somewhere else. We're going to start another church to serve. And I said, why? He explained the struggles that she had. I said, listen. So when I loved him, he was such a good friend. I can be honest with him. He wouldn't get hurt. I said, you know your wife has challenges. You know she's got uh, personality challenges. She has uh, things that she has to learn to navigate. And he said, yes, I know. He was honest enough. He knew that. I said, you're going to take that to your next church. This problem is going to be, it's going to start all over in due time. Maybe it's a bigger church. You hide for a little while, but eventually it's going to shake out because we have to fix what's broken with us. <laughs> All of us in life, I went to a class, I was sharing with Brother Dennis a couple weeks ago from the police department. He described this metaphor to us. He said, we're walking through life with a wheelbarrow. A policeman comes to the, comes to the job with a wheelbarrow where he's putting baggage in this wheelbarrow. And finally, he gets hired on the police department and he's got this wheelbarrow full of junk. And as he goes through his career, he's adding junk to that wheelbarrow. And sooner or later, it just, when 
you see the iceberg, you heard the tip of the iceberg, you don't know what's going on below that, that surface. There's so much in everybody's life. And in the life of a policeman who's required to make critical decisions, it depends on how much stuff is in that wheelbarrow. It tips over, the air goes flat, whatever the case may be, and then he has a problem. Listen, I said all that to say this, but it's also true in the life of the mill worker. It's true in the life of the school teacher. It's true in the life of the Uber driver. It's true in the life of your pastor. And it's true in the life of the average person in the church. You're pushing a wheelbarrow full of junk. And nobody else knows what kind of junk you got in that thing. So let's cut each other some slack. Let's minister to one another. Let's love each other. Let's forgive each other. How about that? If we can't get past this in the middle, I'm telling you, church family, if we can't get past in this middle, our mission is done. We will never make disciples who make disciples. We'll only draw more people up to us who are just like us through the law of attraction and recreate what we already have, which is not a healthy church at all. Amen? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul, with all your mind, with all your feet. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said all of the law, all of the things are there. Do that. If you haven't been doing it, I challenge you today to let's do that. Let's do it. And I brought Chris to play something for us on the camera. And during our response time, I want you to search your heart. I want you to ask the Spirit of God, is there something you're holding on in your life? Is there a person that you haven't forgiven? Whatever it is, I'm telling you, I call those prayer blocks. They're hindering your prayer. They're hindering your walk. I want to challenge you this morning. And if you're stuck in one of those spaces on that triangle, ask the Spirit of God to reveal it. Show you where you're at so that we can move past it. Our desire is to serve the King of Kings. Amen? And we need to remove these obstacles that are in the way. I'm telling you, most churches, most people are stuck in the belonging and the love and the need. And sometimes it's just our perception. Sometimes you're not there at all. You just feel like you are. I'm going to ask you to join me stand. As Brother Chris plays, if the Spirit of God moves, I would encourage you to come forward. If you have someone to pray for, and you want someone to pray for you, I would encourage you to come forward.